thank you very much for coming to Dame Zandra Rhodes' home. And um, I'm going to do a proper introduction um, for your home and your wonderful <laughs> career. But to kick things off, I want to introduce someone really special to me. So I'm Smithy from Bags of Ithix, and um, a few years ago I had the great privilege of studying um, at the London Business School. And one of my favourite professors um, is here today, and she is the driving force and uh, the catalyst behind Bags of Ethics. She told us that it's a wonderful brand to foster and to nurture. And many of you here today have had a direct impact on our brand. Um, I can see wonderful, familiar faces, very dear to my heart, people who've supported us from the British Fashion Council, the next British Fashion Council, my dear friend Millie, who launched the Great British Designer Face Coverings Project with me, Alice Beer, who's from the telly, who talked about our witch accreditation, and various different buyers from various different um, companies are here today. So thank you so much. We also are really happy that some of our direct consumers are here. And I'm, I'm so privileged. Um, and my mother always says, attitude and gratitude. <laughs> and if you have the right attitude and you're really grateful for everyone who's impacted you in your life, um, then uh, things should hopefully go your way. So Professor Simona Botti is the chair of marketing um, and professor of brand marketing at London Business School. And what she's going to do today is talk to us a little bit about what is a brand and how does one define a brand? Because many of us here today are either consumers of brands um, in our professional lives, but certainly in our personal lives. And um, sometimes when we make our buying decisions or we found a brand and we want to um, think about what are the key ingredients for a brand success, they often have been backed by great theory. And Professor Simona Botti is world renowned for her work. She's just flown back from Singapore um, just to be with us today. So we're really, really grateful for her to shape the discussion around what is a brand. And then we move on to a conversation um, between Dame Zandra and I. As part of Bags of Ethics, 90% of our workforce are women. And we are really proud to have women here today. I was speaking to someone um, the other day and they said that, you know, we sometimes just need our own space. And so this forum, as our Bags of Ethics Women's Network, is just our space. And as much as we have a few man ambassadors around, mm -hmm. this is your time to say what you'd like to say in a very safe space. And as part of our women-led brands, we've, we've got about five or six brands, uh, women-run or women-led, um, who will be telling us in a minute about their company. And they'll also showcase their products. Um, and it just gives you a platform to talk more about your work. So, without further ado, can everyone put their hands together in a big cheer for Professor Simone Botti? So, thank you so much. This is um, uh, an honor to be here. I uh, never met them, Zandra, but it was lovely to <laughs> chat with you for a while. I don't have the same colors, but we have the same haircuts. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm close. And then Smruti, I mean, whatever she says about me, um, you know, only like a minor truth there, because the, the real truth is when you teach, the important thing are the students. And, and you learn from the students. And if a class goes well, it's because the students are great. And uh, Smruti was one of the best students I've ever had. And I've been doing this for, for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> you may, you may, you may. Yes. And Dr. Sri, uh, who's uh, a man, but uh, Smruti's father, so he has a very good role in society. And, uh, and I met him recently, too, and I also learned from, from them. They're lovely people. I don't know you, but I'm sure you're all smart and committed and fun. Uh, and so I hope to meet some of you um, later. Now, uh, theory, it's, uh, it's good because uh, you know, it's easy. Uh, you, uh, you actually do the practice, and so your job is, is much more difficult than mine. But I do have like some uh, you know, things that I believe are important when you think about brands, because a lot of people think about brands and they think about the logo, the colors, the advertisement, the, the social media. Uh, but I think brands are strong if they drive the business and if they provide value to the business. And to provide value to the business, they have to provide value to to the consumers. So there is one thing that in my class I always insist on, uh, and I think it's like it's the central, it's the key of creating strong brands, uh, and I call it brand identity. Other people call it brand essence, other people call it brand DNA. And what is it, this brand identity? It's like what are the associations that you want as a brand consumers to have in their mind when they think about your brand? So when they see uh, the Zandra's logo of her brand, what do they think of? What are the words that come to mind? And that's the, the key 
of the brand because for the brand to be strong, these associations have to be one, relevant to the consumers. Relevant to the consumers means they have to create value for the consumers. And create value for the consumers means that they have to make their life better in an economic way, in a functional way, in a symbolic way, in an emotional way, usually a combination of this. And the second thing to have a strong identity and a strong brand is that these associations will be differentiating from competitors. If you create value, but everybody else creates the same value, uh, you don't have a strong brand. Okay? So important that the brand associations have to be strong and differentiating and relevant. Now, if you're creating a brand, you have to start thinking now about your identity. You have to start thinking now what consumers are going to eventually associate with that name, with the logo, with the jingle, whatever it is that, that you're creating as an asset. Um, what is going to make this brand successful? What is going to make this brand relevant and differentiating? And if you have a brand that exists for a long time, like the James Andras brand, you have to think back and think what are the associations that made that brand relevant and differentiating to start with and then generate the success of the brand. Now, why this is important? Because the identity defines the territory where you play, defines the territory where you, are, you have a reputation, and defines a territory where if the competitor comes, you can kind of kick them off because you say, like, I am in this territory. I have built this territory around me. Who are you? But if you move outside of that territory, then it's become, it becomes difficult to compete because you don't have the reputation, and somebody else owns that territory, not you. Okay, so this identity defines the territory, and this identity defines the consistency of your actions. So every action that you do, you have to think about yourself, is this consistent with the identity? So it's very important because it helps you in decision making. When you have to decide, do I partner with this other brand or not? You know, like, a, like in this case, do I do this advertisement or not? Do I have this influence or not? These are all easy decisions to make if you ask yourself, is this consistent with the identity that they want the consumers to have in, in, in their mind? And it also guides your brand over time. Right? So brands have to change over time because competitors change, because technology change, because life change, because culture change, because what is relevant changes. Um, but at the same time, you cannot just follow the consumers around because you lose your identity. So this change over time has to be driven, has to be guided by your identity. You have to change, but at the same time, you have to remain consistent to who you are and who you have been all along. And that's the, 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 the difficult part, but I think the important part for a brand. So I have some uh, examples of brands that everybody knows and like we, we talk about in, in, in the class. So for example, Nike. You think about Nike, you may think about grit, individualism, action. Uh, Apple, you think about Apple, you can think of iconoclast, human, design, simplicity. Uh, you think about Cacharel, you think about youth, you think about something that is for yourself, for the self and not for others. You think about Burberry, you think about British, iconic, classic, functional. Few words, very clear in their meaning, you know exactly what iconoclastic mean, you know exactly what individualistic, what grit mean. Not generic, not innovation, quality, sustainability, which you know everybody can claim or shout, but then you know uh, it's not differentiated, it's not clear exactly what they mean. And how, if you think about these brands that have evolved over time, you can see that they are they've evolved, but they're still the same. So, for example, Apple is less iconoclastic now. Everybody's an Apple is a mass brand; it's not iconoclastic any longer. But still, it's kind of tuned up some of this association. For example, the simplicity and the human and the design are even stronger than they used to be. Or Nike has a more inclusive interpretation of what grit mean, of what individualism mean nowadays. Or Cacharel is still not sexy. It's very important also to say like what you are not, right? Cacharel is not sexy. It's youthful. It's playful, but it's more empowering than 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 it used to be for the women. Or Burberry is very much British. It's, they, they kind of like build on this Britishness, but they're more fashionable than the classic. So you kind of move around the meaning of certain association. You tune up certain association. You lower certain association down. But the most important thing is think about what associations your brand has. Think back, again, if you have a strong brand. Think forward if you are like a startup. But be very clear about what is it that consumers should have in their mind when they think about the brand. Is it relevant? Is it differentiating? Is it clear? Is it generic? What is not? What is your brand? And let this association 
guide your the evolution of your brand. Let this association define your territory, and this way you're gonna have that brand driving the business, not just being like you know the coloring department, but driving the business and help you out making business decisions. Anything? Can I see very well? Oh, I'll go through it. Yes. But what happens when you have a brand yeah. and you think you know what your brand is and then the way that you have to project your brand has yeah. changed. So like old fossils like me <laughs> who come up through an old fashioned route and suddenly you've got to do your brand a whole different way. Yeah. That compromises your brand. Yeah, so I think there are two things. One thing is the action, is the implementation, right? And one thing is the strategy. So what I talk about here is the strategy and you can do the strategy in different ways. So, you know, I am 51 too. So influencers for me is kind of like a word that I do not, you know, I do not know what they are. But that's the implementation, right? They know what they're doing, right? You just have to, not just, they, they, from your strategic perspective, you have to say, is this influencer consistent with my brand and brand identity? And then you have to give the, the right briefing. It's like, you know, in the past when you have an ad agency or in, in right now still you have an ad agency. The most important thing is the briefing because they are creative, right? They are influencers, they are the agents, they are creative. But so their creativity can go in any direction. You are the one that has to rein this creativity in the direction that you think is consistent with what you want to communicate to your, to your, to your consumer. So I don't think anything changes really. Uh, it's just that the implementation changes, but the fundamental principles are the same. More difficult it is how, you know, what is relevant for the generations of nowadays is not relevant probably for the generations in the past. Like we have all this idea of like an inclusivity and body positivity. And so this is a big change, right? Mm -hmm. So your brand has to be able to change with that, but at the same time stay true. Yeah. Right? And so for certain brands it's very difficult because if you are very much anchored their identity on these associations that nowadays are not relevant any longer, very difficult to keep that consistency and stay relevant. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, and that's where the magic of brand happens uh, because there are ways in which you can do it, but also ways in which you can make it like very, very, um, you know, make, can make big mistakes. Mm -hmm. But um, not all the brands can be rescued. Uh, but in general, if you have your association that are the, you know, kind of a, a level that is good enough to provide directions, but not to keep you tight. In a, in a territory, then you may be able to evolve over time. But that's the key and that's the most difficult thing that, to do, I think. So what are the brands of 2023 to watch that they're gonna stand up uh, in, in this case? So, well, um, I think that some of the strong brands, they're gonna still be there, okay? So the, 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 the strong brands, the strong names, I think they're brands that have been able to um, stay relevant for a long time. And I don't see how the, 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 the specific changes in 2023, they're going to kind of, um, um, you know, influence them negatively. Of the new brands, or the brands that come, you know, now on the, on the, on the market, I think, I do think that those who do what is now very relevant, and they do it well, mm -hmm. and they've started doing it some time ago, they're not just kind of rushing themselves into into this idea of sustainability, of inclusivity, of what is relevant for today, uh, I think those are the ones that are gonna stand up. I do think that there is a lot to do in the sustainability space. Um, but I also think that you can do it well or not very well. If it is only lip service, kind of, um, you know, consumers are gonna figure it out. If you think about sustainability as a way to create value for your business and for consumers, I think this is the, the, the way to go. So. I, do not, I cannot think about like specific names, apart from the names that I guess, you know, they've been going through a lot of uh, changes nowadays, but for the new names, those who have like this, um, whatever is relevant today, and they can do it in a differentiating way, um, but also say true to what they really believe. Just a quick question on digital brands, yeah. and whether you think they need to meet their customer in real life. <laughs> <laughs> So I think the, the you know the most successful brands they seem to be able to do both, right? So the, the digital and the and the physical, the offline and the online. Um, you know, big online brands are going offline nowadays. 
uh, and you know brands have been very strong like for example Burberry just because I, I, I know the case they've always been able to blend the online and the offline so this omni-channel or multi-channel idea I think is important it's an important idea because the experience right with the brand is important it's very difficult to to to, to, to have an experience that is completely digital. Mm -hmm. So the digital seems to be where you make the business, where you make the sales. And the experience seems to be where you build these associations and that facilitate the sales. Mm -hmm. So, you know, working in the physical space, like you come here, you know, even if you don't know Dem Zandra, you understand her. You understand her, you know, mm -hmm. personal identity and a brand identity because you're sucked into these colors and, and, and vibrancy and, and, uh, you know, and, um, yeah, and it's like deep experience of life, right? Of life lived in, 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 in depth. How can you explain this uh, in words if you don't have the sensorial, um, you know, experience? And can you really do it in a digital uh, format? I'm sure you can go close to that, but still the physicality of it has also some advantage that digital doesn't have. So I would say, the blend of the of the two in a consistent way, driven by the identity. Um, that, that I think it's the way to go. She is amazing, isn't she? Nah. Yes. yes. We are completely indebted to Dame Zandra for allowing us into her home. This is your living space. A riot of colour, creativity, uh, vibrancy, and um, it's a great privilege to be here. And um, I'm sure many of you know uh, Dame Zandra and her work, but I just want to give you a few sort of highlights of this most amazing and illustrious 50 plus year career um, as a brand owner. So the topic of discussion today is brand lives. How do you create and build a brand legacy? And as someone who's a living legacy of your work, we are greatly privileged to have you here. So born in 1940, 40. <laughs> um, so you can see she's a very glamorous octogenarian. Um, Dame Zandra is a, you're, you're an English fashion designer and textile designer, um, and you started your early education in fashion um, foundation and uh, in textile prints, and has famously designed for Princess Diana, Diana Ross, Freddie Mercury, I mean, the list goes on. Um, and in 2003, we are actually sitting on top of the Fashion and Textile Museum. And Dame Zandra was asked to, to build this museum, and she will tell you more about it. But you've created an institution, um, not only in your name, but also not in your name, a, a great British institution, um, and in, in 2003. And then in 2014 was given a damehood. Um, and as part of your work in the Fashion and Textile Museum, your first exhibit was around your first favourite dresses, where you personally phoned up Oscar de la Renta, Valentino, uh, Donna Karen, Giorgio Armani, and said, give me your first favourite dress to exhibit in my museum. So we are sitting in fashion legendary uh, space, and I could not be feeling more privileged. So can we have a warm, warm welcome for Dame Zandra, please? <laughs> I have a series of questions. Um, so what compelled you to start your brand and why did you call it Zandra Rhodes? Um, I trained, basically I'm a textile designer that couldn't find a job. <laughs> <laughs> I went to the Royal College um, in, in the, at the same time as David Hockney, so I was there in what, um, from 1960 to 1963 and was very influenced by both David Hockney and Warhol. So I was doing pop-art textiles. And then um, the college, um, I decided that um, I wanted to do um, dress fabrics instead of furnishing fabrics. Mm -hmm. And the college um, took me up to Manchester and I tried to sell my work and the people just sort of laughed at it and they said, <laughs> Um, we couldn't sell that and they'd show me some terrible texture and everything. So basically, I left the Royal College with a first class honours degree in textiles and I taught two days a week to make the money to live. I hated teaching. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, did my own work in between. And 
the college then, as I couldn't sell my work, the college said, well, why don't you? They, they really, the Royal College were fabulous. They guided me, and I went straight to two designers in Carnaby Street, Marion Fole and Sally Tuffin, and took the paperwork for my prints, and then became what's called a converter, and they showed me where I could get, my, get things printed. So I basically did all the separations, and for two years did the prints for Fole and Tuffin. And then they decided they were going on to something else. And then I eventually, I then set up um, a, a design company with Sylvia Ayton because I'd never thought that I'd be making dresses. So I, Sylvia Ayton and myself um, designed um, collections and we found it was difficult to get through to buyers. So we found, we, we, I was introduced to Vanessa Redgrave and she, I think she put down something like 300 pounds and helped us open a shop in the Fulham Road, which was the Fulham Road clothes shop that people can slightly remember. <laughs> and um, that stayed open a year. <laughs> and, um, but we did get very good publicity. <laughs> and um, then Sylvia got offered a job with Wallace Shops and said bye bye Sandra and the shop closed. And I thought, I, um, oh, and my mother had just died, and I mm. think I got left four hundred pounds or something. Mm. And I thought I'm going to, and I'd met these mad Ukrainian American models, <laughs> and they said, "You've got to come to America. You'll make your fortune." I mean, you know, how, you don't know how you, but the life's a case of sometimes you don't know why you believe this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so I put together a collection of about ten garments. I got. Another friend who originally had trained as a librarian, so he didn't say, you're a textile designer, you can't be a fashion designer. And I thought, well, the fashion designers didn't look that much brighter than I was. Why can't I do it? <laughs> I do it. So I got him to show me how to make patterns, and I hired a machinist. And I had one American friend who said, if you come to America, you can stay in my apartment in New York. And I'd already this wonderful um, girl... Marit, Marit Allen, who became Marit Lieberson, had photographed my things with, um, with the Fole and Tuffin things that I'd done. And um, Bo, English Vogue gave me a letter of introduction to the head of American Vogue, wow. uh, Deanna Vreeland. And I went there with my clothes over my arm and, I said, and, and she raved about them and, set, and, and immediately photographed them on Natalie Wood. Oh, wow. And... Oh, wow. Um, introduced me to Henry Bendel, the top boutique in, um, in, in New York at that time. So I went, I didn't, the man who they thought would back me didn't back me, but I came back and I produced my little orders. And then I, from there on, I went backwards and forwards across to America. And basically, although I, um, I had, I eventually, in about 1973, I, I had a backer with Ronnie Sterling, and um, I had a shop in Bond Street for 10 years. But I went really backwards and forwards to America, and I had a small boutique in um, Bloomingdale's, and I did shows around America. So basically, I was always going backwards and forwards to America, where most of my career was really made in that sense. Um, what else can I say? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I said, you know, why did you call it Sandra Rhodes? I just put my own name on it, and that <laughs> is my name, so, um, <laughs> you know. So, because some brands, you know, well, a lot of fashion brands do have their own name in it, but was it, was, as Simona was saying, that your um, brand identity is so strong within yourself. Was that what defined your brand? I think it probably did define it. And I mean, when I, in my first, that first trip to America, I still look at with amazement because also the friend that I went, I was staying with, he was an interior designer who eventually designed my shop both in Bond Street, off of Bond Street and Grafton Street, and he designed my shop within Harrods that I had at that time. And, um, and became the top decorator in Houston. But he took me round to see um, a friend who was working for a, the top interior decorator, Angelo Dongia, who, if you've been watching the Holston film, he was a decorator for Holston. Mm. 
and um, and he we went and in those days I still had um, black hair in those days <laughs> and I had a scarf on and I used to draw with lipstick all over my face and everything and um, he, we went to see see um, his friend and, and the the guy Andrew Donkia said well if you look like that your designs must be amazing so he said can I see them well by chance I also have my designs with me <laughs> so I showed him my designs and he commissioned a range of um, of curtaining and furnishing fabrics so um, that was really my start in America and it really continued with me going backwards and forwards to America um, apart from the way my, my company is but like most things if anyone's got a business it doesn't go all the way up it goes up and down and you get ups and you get downs and but I mean I happen to be a workaholic <laughs> and, um, and like doing like to do the work whether it's sometimes a big challenge you know you get times when you think this is impossible and you get other times where it works out wonderfully and then funnily enough I mean I had a really sort of down period towards the end of the 90s and I'd always saved all the clothes that I'd done and my great friend Andrew Logan um, said to me he lived around the corner from here and this was a really sort of I wouldn't say it was a down and out area but it was an undeveloped area and he said Sandra you've always wanted to do a museum why don't you do a museum and I because I my my work was going along and um, he said why don't you there's this building going and I worked out if I sold my house in Notting Hill Gate, it would buy this building. And then luckily, through my boyfriend in America, I got an introduction to the top architect of Mexico, Ricardo Ligaretta. And I said, this is an up and coming area. And I flew into London on my first class mileage ticket. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I got together a group of architects and we said, this is an up and coming area. And it was really a makeover. It wasn't a new building, because someone said, he only does new buildings. So he did it, and it's now got a plaque on it. And so, um, I, and then they hadn't built the shard, you see. So mm -hmm. it really was, I, it was affordable before. Then people say, how do you feel about the shard? And I go like this to it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so, you know, I mean, I've always said that, um, Things aren't always what they're perceived to be, but on the other hand, I keep thinking, well, I wouldn't want to do anything else, and it's taken me on wonderful journeys, and I like doing my work, and I like doing things like this, so what more can I say? It seems like um, you have a real zest for connecting with people, and you've, you've dropped, um, very humbly, lots of the people who've supported you along the way and all of the collaborators that you've had, but you've clearly been able to get into the right places at the right time. I think a lot of the time as well with business, it's how you look at it and you look at the opportunities. And when things aren't going right, you certainly don't say they're not going right. You've got to, you, you know, you've got to present the best face and say to yourself, well, what else would you be doing? And so my work has given me lots of fantastic opportunities that I wouldn't have had otherwise how you surround yourself with people um, and you hire people who are great for your brand because I've been connected very kindly to, to Kelly who is fabulous in your team and, um, and it seems like you really hire incredible people. What are the sort of key qualities you look for? Gosh, probably half of it is they have to put up with me. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I mean? But um, uh, I think Everyone grows into a job as well, um, and it's we're now fairly, fairly small, little, tight knit group now because just before COVID, I still had a working print room underneath the, uh, right on the ground floor here. We printed all the fabric that we we do, and everything like that, and then upstairs we we made the clothes. But when COVID occurred. We closed that, but then during COVID and right through, I've then had lots of different licensing jobs. So I've done IKEA, Happy Socks, all things that require really putting pattern on things. So that it, and I suppose because my pattern is 
very individual and people look at it and go, oh, it's a Sandra Rose. They're either going to like it or they're not going to like it. So, I mean, there's that aspect to it too. I mean, we're sitting actually in a, in a really incredible room of women, um, some of whom are tastemakers of brands, some of whom have real uh, legacies in brand licensing and many brands who, bra buyers of brands. So it's, I'll be curious to have some Q&A from the audience because I will, I will keep quiet very shortly. <laughs> um, um, and it'll be interesting to get their perspective because I really respect a lot of the people in the audience and what they would have to say about what you said. Um, one of the members of the audience is actually our banker. And I want to know, uh, how did you finance your brand? How did I finance my brand? I, th I mean, I sort of like, it was very hand to mouth until um, I had my shop in Bond Street where I then went into partnership with Ronnie Sterling. And um, that was really... Uh, that would be, I think, about 1973, when we had the shop in um, um, the shop in Grafton Street, off of Bond Street, um, and I was with him for about probably about eight years. And then, um, when we closed, I separated from him when we closed the the shop in Bond Street, and then gradually have staggered along, as they were today to say. <laughs> when you started your brand, did you ever think that it would last this long? I didn't think about it. I just thought, um, as long as I, I'm working and I don't have to teach. <laughs> <laughs> your profession doesn't teach very much. Um, <laughs> you know, and uh, really, it's been... It's just been all sorts of different projects, you know, that have come my way. And, and I mean, I was in America really for sort of 30 years. Um, I met my partner and luckily he was a workaholic, so he didn't notice that I was, <laughs> which is very useful. And um, he was in the film business. He was the, the president of Warner Brothers uh, in America and then expanding all of the view cinemas that you've seen over here. And so I, I really, and I didn't want to give up my business, so I'd be over there for a month and then I'd come back here for two weeks and sort of just kept my business going like that. And, and then be, by being there, I had lots of other fabulous projects, like being in America, I got to design um, three operas while I was there. And the Pearl Fishers one that I designed has done um, 20 towns across America because it's a traveling opera. And so, I mean, I, so I, I do all sorts of different things. I call it ducking and diving. <laughs> <laughs> um, when we scan the room here, I mean, it's, it's an incredible space that you have. But something that you showed me um, when I came, which is a reference to your partner, is on uh, the right-hand side wall um, that I'd love to just show to everyone. Can <laughs> oh, you, you mean all of the... Um, yeah, these... can you tell everyone about these uh, oh, well, lovely these mirrored... Are every year for his birthday... <laughs> Well, from when he was 91 to 98, we, he had one. I got Andrew Logan to make a mirrored um, that, that goes 91, 92, goes right up to 98. So the, and he liked those. Those were on the stairs as he went up to went up to bed in his wheelchair in the end, you know, on his little thing. So um, those have been there. And then in the museum downstairs, it was really because he was such a good businessman that I could really build the museum and he was able to think of because I bought the building and then I couldn't I thought I'd get a government you know a lottery bid mm. <laughs> I put in but I didn't get it no. <laughs> and there I was with this building and um, what what could I do and then he said well, what we do is we will build two floors on top of the, the existing building and we'll build nine apartments yours will be one and then we'll pre-sell the the other eight and that paid for building the whole putting the whole thing together and then i ran the museum for a while because as a textile designer um i always felt that textile designers were sort of the unappreciated side of the business you know when you when you see a wonderful suit by Karl lagerfeld with the weave on a chanel he didn't do that weave. An invisible person made that weave. An invisible person put all of that together. You know, and so I, I've always... It was really, I would like, more homage to textile designers. 
And in fact, the funny thing is the next exhibition which is coming up is a wonderful one that before Warhol became famous Warhol, he actually did a lot of rather amazing textile designs which these two guys have managed to hunt out and they're going to show the different mm. designs he did mm. and they've been tracking them down all across America. Mm. So it's quite wonderful and I get great projects like that which I really enjoy doing. Well, you just attract it because you're just an amazing <laughs> magnet for um, positivity. We um, hope so. <laughs> we, know, we know so. Banks of Ethics, as most of you know, um, has its origins in India, and we have our own factory in India. Pondicherry. In Pondicherry. Oh, no. <laughs> and I like Pondicherry. I was there for um, the Marigold Hotel. That was in Pondicherry. <laughs> you were one of them. I was one of them in, with um, Henry... Um, Blofeld. Henry Blofeld, yes. who's like God for cricket. Yeah. <laughs> so we had a lovely time. Were you with Joanna Lumley as well? Was she no, I was with that? Britt Eklund, um, right. Henry. Oh, gosh. The other people were all TV stars, and I'd never seen Someone them. <laughs> I, I had to phone my sister and say they had Mr. Chuckle. Well, of course, I haven't got children, so I didn't know the Chuckle brothers. So... <laughs> you know, so I didn't know all the others, but we had good fun there. It was mm -hmm. lovely. <laughs> well, in terms of India and your and your love for India, I mean, I uh, just looking at these lovely ornaments. There's a little Krishna here. There's a Mahatma Gandhi there. There's this sort of Rajasthani kind of screen here. You you clearly love India. It, it's probably a country. Of I was extremely lucky. In 1981, I was taken all around India. Um, for the Indian government. The woman in charge was a woman called Pupil Jayaka, but her right hand at that time was Rajiv Seti, who is a person who believes in keeping the crafts of India alive. So I was extremely lucky. And then talking about things that you do, I do things sometimes because I just want to do them. And I went to India, fell in love with it, came back and I had lots and lots of Indian friends. And they, the ones that came to London, I did, all the, did very nice what they call Selvar Kameez and, and everything, but I found they didn't want Western clothes. And I thought, well, in that case, I'm going to do a range of saris. I'm a textile designer. I'll do a range of saris. So I did a range of saris, and I took them to and did shows in Bombay and India, in Bombay and um, Delhi. And I did... I shocked the whole audience, apparently, because I did wonderful saris with panniers and um, wonderful feather headdresses. This is in mm. 1987. <laughs> and, um, and then Japan were doing a festival of India and they chose my sari show to show in Tokyo. Mm -hmm. So uh, I met someone a years later who said they thought that I'd really influenced I didn't make any money from all of that. <laughs> but uh, they thought that I'd really influenced um, uh, India to do, starting to do shows when they started to then come over and really take over the West by storm. But that was in 1987. <laughs> One last question for me before I open it up to the audience. Um, Dame Zandra, we met um, in March earlier this year at the very beautiful Chelsea Physic Garden. That's right, bag of ethics. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I'm really happy that um, the managing director of Chelsea Physic Garden is here and um, we planted the very beautiful china berry together, do you remember? That's right, we all dug with, together with the head of English Vogue as well. Yes, British Vogue, Edward and in full. And, um, uh, but what is what is very evident in your in your home is that you care deeply about nature and plants and sustainability. And so, can you tell us a little bit about you know why it's so important for you? And it's not just on vogue at the moment. I mean, I I, I adore plants, as you can see <laughs> from outside of my camellia. So when I go to places and I look and I think that tree is doing quite well. When I was up in Srinagar at one point, and there was a fabulous. Um, tree all in blossom. I thought, well, if it grows here, it would grow in London. I could grow one of those. <laughs> you know, so it's always when I go to somewhere and see them, I think, that would work here. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I, I enjoy seeing how plants take off and how they go and everything. And they're a great influence to when you might 
you know, you might do, um, I've just done some, some uh, I'm doing a, a, a textile at the moment with all these leaves, so you never know, you could use them for drawing and, and what happens to you and things. My last question, which I think I don't believe it. No, no, no. Sorry, <laughs> sorry no, this is my favourite last question. I just realised that this is well, really my be last a question. <laughs> so, um, how do you look so young? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's luck and makeup. <laughs> I, I dye my hair so it doesn't look grey, so that's a start off. Um, or, or an, maybe it's an accident of birth. <laughs> <laughs> Good genes. Well, we're going to open up to our amazing audience, and we have two roving mics, one of mine and, and one somewhere here. So um, who would like to kick us off for any questions? Stella, um, so I used to work at um, Stella and the Stella Bus magazine. What I'd like to know is what is the secret of your brand longevity? What advice would you pass on? I think reality is that you always present the best face forward that you can because, believe me, I've said, it goes up and down, but one's not going to say, look, I'm at rock bottom. You're going to think, I'm still going in fighting. And I always think, and also I've always said to uh, kids that when I'm talking to them that it's, nothing's ever easy. It's always going to be up and down, whatever, you know, whatever grade you're at, it's still going to go up and down and, and surround yourself with positive friends. Mm -hmm. You know, if you know you've got a lot of work to do, then you certainly don't want to be only with party goers, mm -hmm. you know, they're going to go to the party. And I've said to <laughs> children, you know, when I've talked to students, you say, look, it's a bit like Alice in Wonderland. You've got all those, you've got all those jars up there and it says, I want to be a famous designer and you take the wheel down and you swallow it and once you swallowed it you can't sick it up again <laughs> you, that's you know so you can't go to the party or you go to the party and you leave early because otherwise you're going to feel horribly tired in the morning you know and I mean I, I, I don't believe there's anyone who hasn't got ups and downs but I think you try and surround yourself with people that are positive people that you enjoy their company people that that are workaholics that like their own work, you know, or not the way necessarily, but great friends, and all my friends do things. So, you know, and they'll say, I have to leave early, I've got to get on with something or other. You know, so I think it tends to be a bit like that. So, I'm, I'm Sarah Miller, I'm a fashion critic for America, but I've known for a very long time. The, the question I have and I've admired, I've admired you for Ever since I saw your work in Vogue when I was, I don't know, 11 or something. <laughs> <laughs> um, what I wanted to ask you is, um, how much of your um, your cultural background and your success do you put down to being British? Because I think your charm uh, and your energy um, is, is, has been relevant all around the world, and I think you've attracted, you, through your force of personality, but also through your Britishness. Oh, gosh. <laughs> um, I mean, my mother was a very strong character who would have said, don't give up. I mean, she never knew about my career, but she was extremely encouraging. So I come from a, that sort of family that encourage and everything. And, and like I say, I always think one's friends encourage you. So even when it's not going right, you've got, you know, you think, I've always said, what else would I be doing? And that's the whole point. If I can't think of what else I'd be doing, then... That's that's the answer, regardless of what's happening. Yes, but you've been you you you've been globally successful in in America and in India and so many other places. Um, I think. What do they think of you? Gosh, well, India. <laughs> Why I've you been racist so much? in India. I, it is true that they do like pink. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but I mean, I've been into the most remote villages. <laughs> in India and I, uh, the strangest little old lady would come out of her little house and want to touch my hair. Now, <laughs> now it might not happen now but I mean it, it did all through when I was going around all different villages in looking at you know the weaving and the different crafts and things so um, 
I, I, I don't know. I, 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 and I, I've got wonderful sort of Indian friends. <laughs> um, I always wear salvar kameez when I'm there. <laughs> I don't go around in any Western dress. Um, gosh, it's very difficult. I mean, <laughs> I don't want to say luck. I mean, I think that one is attracted different, different di designers of all different, I mean, I, I, can, I owe a lot to Issei Miyake. Mm -hmm. I went there in 1971 with a, a collection and he, he insisted on making sure that Cebu did a show with me. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? And Karl Lagerfeld took me all around Paris. So I've been extremely lucky with people that I've met who've been wonderful to me and I hope I've been equally wonderful to them. You know, because I think, it, it, you know, friendship does an awful lot. Um, Andrew, and right up to uh, Valentino, to Pier, Pier Paolo Piccolo. Oh, well, he's lovely, you know, that was wonderful when I got <laughs> the phone call asking Pier Paolo wanted me to do his first collection, so that was perfectly wonderful too. So I've, I've had, you know, and I think in life you're always going to get a certain amount of breaks, and I think you have to follow them then when they come, whatever happens. you you somehow follow that break and, and take it what it is. And always present your best foot forward. And your best foot might be a disguise. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and, and the other thing I've always said, you know, if you, if you go to see the bank manager, then you don't go as a hippie. You do your best. You go in your idea of a suit but you go dressed up you don't go take it or leave it you you show respect for each person that you're approaching for that job so you know you because i think that makes a lot of difference too is that amazing, help? amazing tips <laughs> <laughs> open and honest. You never say anything is easy. You've talked yourself down and actually your talent is incredible and that's why you've done well. But you've also shown real perseverance and passion. And my daughter said she was so impressed about your honesty and what you said to these children at the school. And I can see this in you. It's be brave. And you've been incredibly brave about the things you've talked about. And you say you've been lucky, but I think you've made it a lot. Um, and I think it was hugely, hugely impressive for her. And she said it fits with her all the time. She oh. became a lawyer, much to my stress. But <laughs> <laughs> she's fascinated by fashion. And she said you were one of the people that made a huge impression on yeah. her. And I just want to say that I think for all of us, it's not about luck. You make your own luck. And I think yeah. you've been amazing. Well, I think you just don't give up. Yeah. You don't give up. And I mean, a lot of people that, that have, you know, been incredibly successful also, you know, you can be right down. But I think that you've got to just put your best face forward, whatever you're doing. It's yeah. a really, really simple question, actually, because I'm a menopausal woman. I can't even remember who my husband is most days. <laughs> <laughs> actually, actually, you have sat there and recalled names and dates yeah, and places yeah, yeah. and colours and textures and smells. And I'm in awe of that. I mean, what have you done with your mind? <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to introduce yourself, Angela? Oh, yeah, hello. I'm Angela Bruder. I loved talking, listening to you today, by the way. It's a huge privilege, so thank you very much. Thank you for being yes, here. You. Um, do you have anything to say about how you kept your mind in shape? <laughs> <laughs> I don't drink alcohol. Really? Uh, oh, no. no. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Wrong answer. <laughs> it sends me to sleep. <laughs> and then I'm extra boring. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have a drink? No, you have I did a bit. I, my, my, one of my early boyfriends said, if you fall asleep at the dinner table any more times, I'm, I, we're just not going to go out to dinner. But then I met someone that always fell asleep at the dinner table. <laughs> <laughs> and that was fabulous. <laughs> Uh, we had a buying sign at Sainsbury's for celebration 
Um, you've achieved so much, and you've done so many wonderful and exciting things, and you've collabed with people recently. What's on your bucket list professionally when you've done so much? I don't have a bucket list. <laughs> I look around and I say, I've got to have another job lined up. <laughs> <laughs> what can we do? What, you know, and then if we, and like, we, we did arrange for Happy Socks, which I love doing. And then I, they still hadn't done anything with a design that I really wanted them to do. So we phoned them up and said, we think you should do some more things. <laughs> you know, and they did. So I just always pray that another job comes along that we can do. And um, so far, I've been lucky. <laughs> But I, I think I have to emphasise that nothing is ever what you think it's going to be. No. And I think that, and, and, and like what Sarah was saying, you, you, it's what you make it. You've got to also, in a way, talk it up. If you overdo it, people would know if you talk it up too much. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, you, you talk up the product or you look at the good side of the product that you're doing and think of where it can go and what it can do. You know, you must have thought of that when you thought, well, right, we could do the Queen's Canopy and we could do that very mm -hmm. well. And it emphasises what you could do to emphasise not only a product that you've got, but you do it for a cause as well. Mm. You know, and I think that that, that comes through too. Uh, hi, I'm Sue Medway from Chelsea Physic Garden. Um, my question is a bit about that resilience that you talked about earlier and the fact that in the last sort of two and a half years, we've seen many people struggling really hard um, through what has been a really difficult time. And I just wondered how, you know, what advice you might give to those young people who found this whole change that's been brought about and that sort of lack of control that any of, the, any of us have been able to have over our lives and whether you've got some sort of fairly simple tips that you could give people which would allow them to be able to move forward on some quite positive steps in what is, what feels still quite unstable ground. I mean, a, a friend, Piers, Piers Atkinson, who teaches at Ravensbourne and was teaching at Medway, um, was very conscious as a teacher who, um, he's, he's also head of my foundation that I put together, he said, um, he, what he was most conscious of is how awful it was for students who had, some of them come from abroad, and there they were in a bed sitter, and all that was happening was they were being taught by um, Zoom, mm. and how difficult it was to be inspired and, and do things, you know what I mean? Which I, I can see how awful that was, and, and how... I mean, to me, I liked going into college and I was very happy at college. I didn't want to go out to work. I was quite happy mm -hmm. at college working there, you know, and to come out and then have to earn a living was something else. Um, gosh. I mean, I think the most important thing is to have friends and, to tr and family to try and, you know, keep that going to so that you, you, you know, you somehow... Don't get yourself get depressed. It's difficult to know exactly what to advise in, in things like that. I think, I mean, I come from a very positive family. My mother was an amazing, amazing woman who died before she knew that I'd made a success of what I was doing. Um, you, you never know how, how things are going to hit you when, um, when you... Um, what should I say, in life, you're never quite sure what's going to hit you and how you'll handle it when it comes, which is, is sort of like a strange thing to say. I mean, I, I know that I, I enjoy doing my work and, and, and everything, and I've been very lucky. Um, right at the beginning of COVID, um, my great friend Andrew Logan came came round and he used to do yoga classes in here <laughs> and it was just before covid lockdown and we laid down and we had um uh and and he we were doing deep breathing and i suddenly thought my stomach's full full and what what is it and then i thought well i better go and get an x-ray and then they said oh you've got a growth and you'll have to have chemo mm. but i don't understand it must be in one's also in one's um um what shall I say? Psychic, whatever's in you, 
that it didn't depress me. I suddenly thought, well, um, I, sh I get my foundation together. I've got to make sure my wheel's done. I've got to make sure I do everything. And, and, and it made me far more positive. So I, I don't really know always. I think the main thing is one's friends and family are what keep you going. And I think, you know, you, can, you have to be positive. And I was very lucky. I had two or three friends I could talk to daily. And um, plenty of work. <laughs> <laughs> can I just uh, can I just ask that lady from Chelsea for this garden to say something about that lovely garden that you have because most people would like to know mm. what a beautiful garden you have. I mean, I don't think people realize what a beautiful garden you have there. Okay, quick show of hands. Who's who's been to the Chelsea Visit Garden? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's the easy way out. <laughs> well, we went to the your reception. Just past the National Army Museum on Royal Hospital Road, just under four acres of herbal and medicinal plants, open six days a week, eleven months of the year. Just look us up on our website. Thanks very much. <laughs> I just want to say that this has been a beautiful introduction to um, your life and your work. And I don't know if there's a movie out there about <laughs> your work, but maybe that's the next thing on your bucket list. Maybe. That's so if we've got any uh, um, people in film or know of anyone in film, I think this could be an interesting, wonderful uh, British biopic. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Well, anniversary, so recommend yeah. that. What's that, Millie? There was a documentary made. Which anniversary was it for? Was it anniversary? Was it? Yeah. Did you have that <laughs> documentary made? Did you have that Fashion Week? Did I? Maybe she was not remember. <laughs> 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 My My memory's memory's not the best. Time. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, this, uh, we will have one set of applause now, but can I just say thank you so much, Sandra, for hosting us at the most in in incredible... You know, when the weather was horrible this morning, I thought, oh, God, is anyone going to come? But of course they would come, because you are so magnetic and so positive. You brought the sunshine inside and outside, and we are hugely, hugely privileged um, to be in your presence and to learn so much from you, your positivity, and I hope I you can... I think we all learn enough from everyone here. So, so yeah. That is wonderful, and you are an amazing uh, pioneer and, and leader for our Women's Network, so thank you so much. <laughs> I'm going to call up a few wonderful women who are either representing brands who are women-led or women-founded, and they're going to give us one minute to tell us about their brand, almost like a sort of... They can have my chair and I'll ask the questions. You can <laughs> ask the questions. <laughs> okay, hello everyone. Thank you so much. And thank you so much, Smooty and Bags of Ethics, and also Dame Sandra. It was a beautiful and inspiring speech, so thank you so much. Um, I'm here on behalf of Brody, representing them, um, and I actually just want to start by saying, um, kind of leading on what you were talking about, family and friends. So we're a female-led brand, um, we started in Yorkshire, and it's a mother and daughter uh, founded. It's a cashmere brand, and um, it, it's really inspiring. So it started in 2010, basically just around a table. So it was Anne-Marie and her daughter and her friends, her closest friends that she really relies on in terms of style inspiration, just kind of going out shopping, going for lunch. And they start to have the brand started. So they kind of pull pieces and inspiration from everything that they really love. Um, and Bill, who is her husband and also our director of the brand, his family uh, basically have heritage in the ca cashmere industry and kind of brought cashmere over to Yorkshire. It's a really incredible story. Um, but to wrap it up, we basically have uh, extended our family or our branded family out to Mongolia where we source our fabrics directly from there and the nomadic herders in the hills there. Um, and we kind of have a really interactive kind of relationship with them where we um, make sure that they're all looked after. Um, they, we educate them and um, fund their families and their way of life to make sure they're able to sustain it. Um, from there, we take the, the cashmere fibers directly to our factory in Mongolia, and it's a vertical factory, um, so we're cashmere specialists. And basically, from 
taking the fibers from Mongolia to the, the factory also located there, we then leave in a finished product. So we are kind of reducing waste as much as possible. Um, and also with any cashmere offcuts, we create these kind of um, mm -hmm. out. So we have patch, uh, patchwork scarves that are, we do every single, every single season basically to make sure that nothing is going to get left in the world. And a great thing about cashmere as well, it's regenerative, so it's biodegradable and it's um, British brand and it's really amazing that it's female founded as well. Yeah. <laughs> My name's Alice Asquith, and I founded Asquith uh, 20 years ago. Um, I've been ducking and diving, in your words, <laughs> for 20 years. Um, I founded it because of my love of fashion. I used to sit and watch... Uh, firstly, thank you so much, by the way. Thank you <laughs> for hosting us here. Thank you, Bags of Ethics, and thank you, James Andre, um, who I used to read all about when I was little, and I'd sit on my granny's knee, and I'm wearing her jacket tonight, so in her honour. But she used to make and remake and recut all her clothes. And she inspired me and my mother did to make, uh, to find beautiful fabrics. And when I launched Asquith, it's an ethical activewear brand. And everything is made from natural fabrics, from bamboo, organic cotton. And I've trademarked a fabric called Bamboo, which is a blend of bamboo and organic cotton, because... I hated synthetic fabrics, and when I started 20 years ago, that's all that was available. It's bad for your skin, it's bad for the environment, and at the time when I launched, I was considered a little bit quaint, because everything was, was a bit hair shirt. Um, now, it's come into its own. They're incredibly comfortable, good for your skin. I design everything to be flattering, very wearable, and it's the antithesis of synthetic active wear, which when I started, Big logos. I'm actually wearing one of my polar necks and our flares, so it's <laughs> versatile. And I think for us, sustainability now, it's in the fabrics that we wear. In our, our strap line is feel wonderful, so it's about making women feel wonderful in everything that they do when they're wearing Asquith. It's about the environment, it's about the fabrics, how they feel against your skin, what they're like against your body, great for menopause. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, I shall continue to be ducking and diving. We use a lot of offcuts from our factory as well, so we're circular, same as you, um, factory floor fabrics. And I should continue to duck and dive for the next 20 years in ethical activewear. Hold it up! This is actually it's 80s inspired because I love the 80s. Half <laughs> cuts from the, from our factory, and this is our bamboo legging. It's actually a straight leg pant, and I design everything to be flattering, so it's good for. <laughs> and, uh, long legs and it's very soft and comfortable and it's much better for all of your skin and all of your body than uh, synthetic so that's the main thing thank you for <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Fiona and thank you James Andre for the <laughs> amazing invite. So I have a nightwear brand called Their Nibs, though it wasn't always a nightwear brand, which is interesting about your chat Simona. We've evolved over 20 years, so I was a high street buyer 35 years ago and founded Their Nibs 20 years ago. Um, it's a print, always been a print-led brand. We started with a shop in, in Kensington Park Road, in Portobello Road and... We've evolved to be more the ladies brand. In lockdown, I got the most amazing phone call from a John Lewis buyer yeah. to say, would you like to be a stockist? So three years ago, we became a stockist in John Lewis and have remained one of their best-selling wholesale ladies nightwear brands, which is <clears throat> what we're very proud to say. My colleague, Sia, is here today. So we're a woman-led <laughs> Brand, we, um, we support women, we have a warehouse in Edinburgh full of ladies that pick and pack the clothes. Um, we are starting to look at sustainability, so our second is now recycled. Sia actually, I should say, designs all the fabulous prints, so I can't take credit for that. Um, but it was interesting to, speak, to listen to your chat, Simone, about how brands evolve. So, we were essentially a kids' wear brand with a cool shop in Notting Hill 20 years ago. We're now sat in John Lewis Ladies' Wear, but we're still a print brand. So we still have that at the core of what we're about. Mm. 
Hi, I'm Natalie. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, I founded Glisten Cosmetics in 2017. We are a fun and colourful makeup brand. Um, it's a well, a little bit of a baby compared to 20 years. So, <laughs> um, but uh, I kind of started on Instagram. I was also a teacher and hated teaching, um, <laughs> so um, made it kind of my passion to get out of it. I was teaching and doing it as a side business for probably two, it was three years. In 2020, as the lockdown hit, my business kind of boomed online um, and I went full time with it and now I employ nine lovely ladies and we're kind of like, apart from my husband who also worked for me, we're, <laughs> <laughs> we're fully female led um, and yeah, just a fun kind of brand. <laughs> I just want to say to Natty, I mean, I mean, you're you're quite humble right now. I mean, I how many how many um how many followers do you have on Instagram that you so paid? I I've got three hundred and seventy five at the moment. Um, we're we're bigger than three hundred and seventy five thousand. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. We are bigger in the US than we are in the UK. Um, yeah, I kind of. Grew it all online, started on Instagram, um, was doing kind of videos on Instagram. With my, at the time it was glitter, and once again, I primarily just sell glitter, hence the name Glisten. But when I kind of came up with the name Glisten, I was like, ooh, don't, don't, it has to be something that can be some kind of connotated with something else. So it was Glisten, not glitter or anything. Um, and now we just sell eyeliners mainly, so we've kind of really shifted over. Um, but yeah. What kind Fabulous. of price point? It's about six pounds. Yeah. yeah. Fabulous. Well Hello everyone and thank you Sandra and thank you Shimiti for inviting us here today. Uh, my name is Jenny Colty and I am the co-founder and chef of Fuss and Fig alongside my co-founder also um, Amy Lachana. I'm just going to tell you a bit about my story. So um, I was a chef and I used to work alongside Gordon Ramsay and Jamie Oliver. I then fell pregnant and had a beautiful, lovely boy. A year and a half later, I fell pregnant again, and I had a set of twins. <laughs> so then now a year and a half, um, it was a struggle. It was very hard. It still is very hard, as many mothers would know. Um, but it sort of stopped me from becoming a chef, so I couldn't really do that anymore. Um, I did try to put them into nursery, but as you imagine, nursery costs are very, very expensive, especially for three. Um, so uh, since then, I just thought of, thought to myself, you know what, I need to do something. And my friends came up to me with um, a really good idea, actually, to do a shark, to build a charcuterie company, which is also a gifting and a platter business together, um, which is what we do now. Uh, we've recently soft launched, and today here we have just showcased what we've done. Yeah. I'm I'll pass you to Amy as well just to share her story and her background too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so grateful for you as well. So thank you. So I'm Amy. I'm actually a business coach. I work in the corporate world. I work at Reuters. I head up <laughs> um, client succession there. But my my background is business. I've 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 run businesses from a very young age. Um, so we are our story. <laughs> Our sons met at nursery. <laughs> so because it was COVID, my son kept coming, Noah this, Noah, Noah, Noah. Or every day at home, Noah does this, Noah does this. I'm like, who is Noah? And then one, one day we got Noah's birthday invitation and I finally met Jenny. And then since then, we've grown and we've done this. Oh. <laughs> My son's called Noah, but he's 18 now. <laughs> I don't think they know each other. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I think I'll get the good deal there. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Martha Silcott. I'm the inventor and um, CEO of Fab Little Bag. It's not glamorous. Well, it is for what it is, actually. It's a disposal bag, sustainably sourced disposal bag for tampons, pads, and condoms. It's Usually, um, invention is born out of necessity. This started very unglamorously on the toilet um, at a friend's house when I'm a binner and I had to go and change my tampon, do the loo roll wrap, and went to put it in the bin, no bin, in the downstairs loo. 
You're all thinking now, I've got a pin in the downstairs room. <laughs> Half of you at least have not. Um, so I had to do what we probably have all done at least once, is the sleeve smuggle, followed by the handbag smuggle. <laughs> it actually did make me feel quite awkward at the table, thinking who'd just seen that, what's going on in my handbag. I got really annoyed the next day and marched into Boots looking for a solution and there wasn't any. And the more I looked, the more no one ever spoke about disposal. It's like they magically just disappeared somewhere. <laughs> Which, if you're about half the population of women, they do disappear because you flush them down the toilet. Don't feel guilty. Yeah. I'm just telling you. So actually, you should feel guilty because they end up in the river and the ocean, and it's a it's the fifth largest polluter of single-use plastic in the ocean is sanitary uh, sanitary waste. So I'm on a mission to uh, educate and convert flushers to be binners and to completely revolutionise binning from feeling awkward and anxious to feeling easy, confident, hygienic, and fabulous. So do good, feel good. And that's what Fabulous Bag is as a brand. Hi everyone, uh, my name's Paula and I don't have a scent called Noah. <laughs> um, um, I'm also not a natural businesswoman. I was, well I kind of still am, a um, climate scientist. And my career has been trying to get people to understand the issues around climate change and then, excuse me, I've just got a cold. Um, and trying to get them to take action. And through my nearly 30 year career, I have been a complete failure. Because look, look around. <laughs> I've been a complete failure in my, um, in my uh, attempts. And about a, a decade ago, uh, 2013, I came up with this kind of new approach to try to get people to understand the issues and give them, give them um, ways they can take action, not through doom and gloom, but through fun and games. So what I created with uh, my neighbour and friend and a uh, very talented graphic designer is a series of games, simple social games that we all know because we've played them in the past and we've played them with our kids, our grandkids, our ne nephews and nieces. But these games have got environmental messages in them. Uh, they've got a lot of information and um, and facts and figures actually about how we can take action and what effect that action will have. Now, my company is called Eco Action Games, that's my brand. It's kind of <laughs> does what it says on the two. Yeah. It doesn't <laughs> matter. <laughs> so, they're games that talk about eco, ecological issues and help you to take action. So, that's, that's us. And from the very start, although we've only met recently, Bag of Ethics have been my bag of choice. Oh, yeah. 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 I'm, I'm working with you for back with Bag of Ethics because we're really passionate about keeping women in sport and girls in sport playing sport. So Fab Little Bag is doing a huge amount with rugby and cricket and things like that. And we've created a coach's bag with your fabulous bags and I'll happily show anyone who wants to see them um, later on. They're, they're really practical and perfect for coaches. Aww. So hi, lovely to meet you all. I'm Portia and I work for a sustainability startup called Brand Conscience. And I've heard lots about sustainability, so we actually score sustainability and ethics of consumer products. So you know how on your food items you have the traffic light system for your salty fats, your saturates? We're basically creating one of those for sustainability. So we score factory processes, longevity, recyclability, manufacturing miles and company kindness. And we score them in the traffic light system from red, orange, yellow and green to basically help consumers make informed decisions on their choices. So it's, uh, we're, uh, we're nature, we preserve nature, we use first principles to score it. We do all the hard work for you, so we collaborate with all the factories, suppliers, to collect all the data to do it, to then try and, you know, um, build brand confidence between the consumers and the brand, particularly with issues of greenwashing and stuff. We don't want companies who are actually doing good to do green hushing and everything. So yeah, that's a bit about us. Fabulous. <laughs> Good afternoon everybody. Um, my name is Angela Ferugia and for 25 years I actually ran, built, uh, developed, if you like, the largest brand extension company in the world. 
Woo! Uh, 25 offices, 12 billion in retail sales. That was a long time ago. <laughs> anyway, I came out of that in uh, October 19, thought, okay, what do I do? Well, I suddenly haven't got a huge business around me. So I started lecturing. <laughs> And oh, you hated it, of course. Yeah. <laughs> so, and then I became obsessed with Central St. Martins. I became obsessed with the MA students and supporting them through the first year of their graduation and their journey. And I am still obsessed with young people and young designers in particular on their journey. And actually, I run another course at the University of Westminster for the MA fashion business. So it's the CEOs of the future. And I have tried to get those two colleges together. Mm -hmm. Sarah can kind of talk to this as well. It's not happening. Um, anyway, recently um, took on a project because I've worked in the Middle East a lot and was invited to go and support them on their bringing to the forefront um, Arabic young designers. And captured my imagination immediately. So as ever, I threw myself into that. And um, try to really, it's a very young charity called Fashion Trust Arabia. And it basically looks to bring to the fore uh, designers who, if we think it's tough over here, these are guys that are working in Lebanon and war-torn uh, markets where they literally don't have any infrastructure around them, let alone anything else. So it's, in, in, it's a completely compelling story. Um, I actually looked at what you had done with the British Fashion Council <laughs> and these two ladies and basically had a call with Bags of Ethics and Smithy in particular and said, look, I'm really working to try and raise money and raise awareness to, to help these guys. And I have to say, actually, this isn't about me, this uh, little minute's talk. It's about you <laughs> because there are virtually no people in the world that rise to the kind of call I had. And this lady said, okay, yeah, we can get behind that. And actually, Fashion Trust Arabia bought us the most amazing thing. And Zuhair Murad, who is a massive designer, by the way, in the Middle, in the Middle East, uh, East, gave us one of his designs. And Smitty was able to pull this together in a tote bag where we've sold about 27,000 of them so far, haven't we, in about five weeks. Um, Six dollars of every single product here is going back to the trust and it's going back to young Arabic talent and to their mentorship and their support. So my congratulations to you. <laughs>